Welcome to the mind. What do we really mean by genius? Matters. Giftedness is so much more than an academic label. Podcast. We tend to think of gifted as kids being good at everything across the board. An exploration of giftedness. Originals are nonconformists. Creativity. People who not only have new ideas. Intelligence. They're the people you want to bet on in childhood. I like to learn about things, but I like to learn my way. And beyond. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. Hey there, it's Emily Kircher Morris, and thanks for listening. Just ahead, we're going to be talking with the gifted guru, Lisa Van Gammert. You might have seen her work. She's written a book about perfectionism. She's also been a professional consultant on the Lifetime Network, and she has a website called giftedguru.com. We're going to chat with her about perfectionism and how it affects home, school, and our professional lives. As Mind Matters has grown, we're reaching people all over the world, and our audience is getting bigger every day. When we started Mind Matters, our hope was to extend a helping hand to the gifted community and the mental health community in general. So if you're a teacher or a parent, a mental health professional, or someone who lives with giftedness yourself, we'd be grateful for your help in spreading the word about the podcast. Our website is mindmatterspodcast.com. And if you're listening via iTunes, Stitcher, or an app like Podcast Addict, Overcast, Pocket Casts, or whatever, please subscribe and leave us a review. The Mind Matters Podcast recognizes organizations who help gifted children thrive. One of these organizations is the National Association for Gifted Children. NAGC supports those who enhance the growth and development of gifted and talented children through education, advocacy, community building, and research. We invite you to visit giftednessknowsnoboundaries.org and join NAGC's movement to see, understand, teach, and challenge gifted and talented children from all backgrounds. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. So as we go into our conversation about perfectionism and giftedness, it's important to think about what it's like for people who are identified as gifted or high ability and why perfectionism is sometimes a natural outcome of that giftedness. When things are easy and outcomes are successful, it's natural to expect that pattern to continue. Kids who begin to feel like things aren't coming as easily as they once did may start to show some negative habits associated with perfectionism. So how can we support them and help them learn to seek opportunities to learn and grow without the expectation of perfection? Lisa and I will talk about this and more. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I've been really looking forward to this. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're going to be talking about perfectionism today. And so I got I I was thinking that maybe a good place to start would just be about um, maybe if you could share with us how perfectionism became an area of expertise for you personally. Well, I wish it were just from academic study. (laughs) Right. Unfortunately, it was something that I I came to uh, very organically. I think I was the the typical gifted kid perfectionist when I was a child. And it manifested itself not just in the ways that you would expect, but in things like not wanting to play with toys, but rather just organize them. And I wouldn't actually want to play with the things in my room. And even when I was eight years old, I asked for a hall pass because I wanted people only to leave my room when I said they did. Like it wasn't, it was like this need to control my whole environment. And that perfectionism in like controlling myself, those around me, it led to a lot of issues for me in school, in interpersonal relationships. And as I started working with gifted children professionally, I kept seeing it again and again and again. And so I came to the study of perfectionism in an attempt to try to mitigate some of its effects in my own life so that I would be a better support to the children I was working with. So one thing that I hear a lot is the popular myth that perfectionism is someone who has to have everything organized in a just right way or a student who has to get perfect grades. But I know that it can look a lot different than that. What are some ways that perfectionism looks different that people might not expect? I'm really glad that you asked that question because I think that is one of the misperceptions about perfectionism is that it just manifests itself in people who always look like Barbie. And that is what it is. And yet it has so many faces. And it depends on the environment in which the perfectionism is manifesting itself in 
my book, I talk about Adelson and Wilson's work on how it looks in different ways just in school. So um, we're used to the kind of typical academic overachiever kid who, if they don't get a 98, they're waiting at the teacher's desk for extra credit. But there are also people who their perfectionism manifests itself through risk evasion, where they don't do things that would otherwise bring them joy or pleasure or even an, an appropriate challenge who avoid those things simply because they're worried that they won't be able to do it and in the way and the manner and at the level in which they had wanted to. We also get people whose perfectionism manifests itself in their desperate desire to control how other people perceive them. So they will manipulate um, sometimes those around them um, and their home in order to meet some aspirational view of how they want other people to perceive them. Then you also have people who Addison and Wilson call this um, procrastinating perfectionists. So, and this is tied in with underachievement. So perfectionists do not always have straight A's. Sometimes the perfectionism itself can undermine their achievement. And one of the ways that this happens is that we have an image in our, our mind of how we're going to do a particular thing. Um, for children, this can be something like an assignment in school. You know, the teacher says you're going to do a poster and they get this image in their mind of how the poster is going to look. And, oh, I'm going to have it. It's going to have this dragon coming right out of it. Right. And they have this image of how it's going to look. And then when they try to actually do it, they find that moving it from idea onto paper something was lost along the way and they were unsuccessful and they're so upset about that inability to make it the way that they wanted that they will sometimes completely disavow the entire activity. Like they won't engage with it at all, not in a risk evasion, but in just frustration. And so then they, they put it off and put it off and put it off and sometimes even don't turn it in at all. I remember one time, I think I may tell this story in the book actually, but uh, I was um, needing to clean my, attic out because we were having a roof replaced after our house had been hit by a tornado. And um, in order to motivate myself, I watched an episode of Hoarders with my husband because of course, if you watch that show, you just want to throw away everything you own, right? So I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to watch an episode of Hoarders and get motivated to go up and clean the attic. It's like 118 degrees in the attic. And um, as my husband and I are watching this, the, the woman being interviewed said, well, I'm a perfectionist. And to my husband, that made no sense whatsoever. Like her, like she was a hoarder. It wasn't even like a house that otherwise was nice and was slightly messy, right? He said, how could she be a perfectionist? And I understood completely because sometimes perfectionism manifests itself in this complete throwing in of the towel where you just don't even do what you're capable of because you can't achieve what you wanted to. So what about the kids who are obsessed with always getting 100%, even if they're starting over and over <laughs> uh, multiple times? Even things that don't necessarily need to be redone, right? So, and you, we've all had this experience, I think. Um, I think this is a fairly universal experience where you're working on something, it's not quite right. You try to fix it and you actually make it worse. And you should have just left it and nobody probably would have noticed. And yet, as you try to fix it, you make it worse. And then you keep trying to fix it. And I've seen I've had students um, myself as a teacher who would completely they would erase so hard that they would have holes in the paper. I know when I was a teacher, I had a student one time who very gently and it was a collaborative choice that we made, but I did have to take his pencil erasers from him just to get him to be able to put things down on the paper. That is not uncommon. And white out like white out tape i've had a kid who was so obsessed with white out tape he would write a sentence white out and like the third or fourth time and so one of the problems with this is then we have to start to look at okay how serious is this but even people with kind of garden variety perfectionism can be fixated on that redoing but one of the things that's really tricky about perfectionism is that it's often not very perfect looking and so people think oh they can't really be a perfectionist because he has a messy desk or she's getting C's in school. So how could she possibly be a perfectionist? 
the truth is, is that perfectionism has absolutely nothing to do with production and everything to do with paradigm. It's everything to do with the way that you see yourself and the lens through which you see yourself interacting with the world. So it has nothing to do with how well you're producing stuff. Lots of people produce very high quality work, produce things that other people would consider masterpieces and yet are not at all perfectionistic. Absolutely. And, you know, and I think as we talk about high ability and, and you know, giftedness, um, it definitely seems like there are some factors that influence the perfectionism that they experience. What would you say in terms of the environmental factors that can cause high ability individuals to be especially prone to developing perfectionistic traits? So one of the things that I think is most common is expectations put on them by others. A kid or even an adult will feel as though other people have this expectation of them. Like, what does it mean to be this thing? And this is one of the reasons why it's particularly problematic among the gifted population. A lot of kids feel like other people have the expectation they're going to do everything right. Like, oh, I'm in the gifted program, so all of this should be easy for me and I should be getting A's. And they get told things like, and I have I have heard things like this so many times, they'll say, well, for a smart kid, or, well, if you're so smart, right? So one of the primary environmental factors that we see is the language that's used around them. Unreasonably high expectations that are problematic. And these can be either inferred from the environment, or they can be very, very blatant. And Gifted kids are particularly prone to this because there's a societal bias against giftedness and they pick up on that. There also is just even in some of my favorite manifestations of giftedness, like I love the movie that came out last year, the gifted movie. It was great. However, there are very few kids who actually function like the girl in the movie. But if every gifted kid feels like, oh, uh, you know, I'm gifted, so I should only be using really big words and I need to be solving, you know, the millennial math problems that they set unreasonable expectations for themselves. And and that's how I define perfectionism is unreasonable expectation combined with a lack of self-love. I think a lot of times, um, you know, there are those unreasonable expectations that are that come from society, from parents, from teachers, you know, wherever that might be. I also notice a lot of times there are kids who um, really internalize different things, but then the perfectionism almost becomes, it's its definitely kind of self-imposed. Like the parents might say, no, I don't care if you get B's or C's or whatever, but the kids really feel like, well, my parents expect me to get all A's. They kind of, you know, put that out there. Have, do you ever see that type of a situation where they, where it's more internally based, but it's perceived as coming from externally? Yes, I think that's common. And I also think that we as parents, and I am the parent of three children, and I've, and I've parented foster children, we've hosted foreign exchange students, I have a lot of parenting experience. And I think that sometimes I have to be very careful for myself, that what I'm saying verbally, and the nonverbal message that I'm saying are aligned. Because I think sometimes parents believe that they're reassuring their children, they believe that they are sending this message that You know, we don't expect you to get all A's, but when the report card comes home, it's almost as if the lowest grade were printed in a different color ink. That's the thing that we're immediately drawn to. And we may not comment on on a way that we feel is showing disapproval or a lack of support, but the child may perceive it that way. So I think the dynamic that you're describing happens, and I think that there are three possibilities going on. One is that the child is simply... In inferring something that's not actually there. There's no data to support it. You know, there, mm-hmm. It's a fact that hasn't been entered into evidence. The second possibility is that the parent is not trying to put that kind of pressure on the child. And yet somehow the message is being received that way. And that there is something that parents doing or saying that's making the child feel that way, even though the parent does not feel that way. The third possibility, and I think this is becoming more and more common in an era of sharenting, you know, parenting on social media, is that the parent is him or herself feeling so much pressure because of what other people's kids are doing and what they feel like the expectations are, that even though they would like to believe that they don't have these expectations of their child. The fact is they do have that and even they're not being honest with themselves. 
their child is picking up on it. Or even just the overemphasis of success. The definition of what it means to be successful is part of this dynamic of perfectionism. Would you say that perfectionism is inherently a negative quality or a negative trait to be overcome? Are there instances where it can be viewed in a more positive way? So you've asked the most controversial question among academicians researching perfectionism. There is a camp that feels that there is no such thing as an even neutral level of perfectionism, that all perfectionism is negative. And then there's a camp that would divide perfectionism into two different qualities, either maladaptive, meaning harmful to you, or adaptive, meaning that you've made it work for you. And, and I would put myself in that camp because I think that perfectionism, there are areas of in, our, in our lives where perfectionism is helpful. If I have a child who's diabetic and they're supposed to check their blood sugar at certain times of day and they're supposed to eat a certain diet in order to preserve their health and even life, then I want them to follow that perfectly. I don't want it to be like, oh, well, you went to a birthday party, so you ate four pieces of cake and you forgot to check your blood sugar. No, you need to be following this exactly. If you're a neurosurgeon operating on my brain, I want you to do it just right. It works for you in that circumstance as long as it doesn't paralyze you with anxiety. Most of us are not equal opportunity perfectionists, even if we are perfectionists. We're not the same level of perfectionism. We don't have the same level of perfectionism or manifest it in all areas of our life. So you can have a kid whose desk is messy but and whose backpack is messy, but whose closet looks like something out of an HGTV show. So, or you can have a kid who's perfectionistic about their schoolwork and yet not at all perfectionistic in the way that they handle their things or their belongings. And so one of the difficulties in answering that question about whether perfectionism is always negative is which area of our life are we talking about? And so you can have perfectionism manifest itself in a way that works for you. And that's really the same with almost any mental health issue. There are people who are very, very neat but that doesn't mean that they have obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Like it's not causing them pain. It's working for them. It works for them. It works for the people around them. It doesn't interfere with their relationships. It doesn't cause them anxiety. And they have high expectations of themselves, but it's not got that combination of a lack of self-love that I mentioned before. They have high expectations of themselves. And when they meet those expectations, they find gratification in there. If they don't meet those expectations, they have enough self-love to say, oh, well, right, I'll, I'll try again next time. And I like that example that you gave of, you know, the equal opportunity perfectionism, because I think that's so true. Um, sometimes when we talk about perfectionism, whether it's to teachers or to parents, they assume it's going to be a general trait that's going to be evident in many different or in all areas or most areas, at least. And um, and then sometimes it gets overlooked, um, you know, in terms of how to handle it. Earlier, you also kind of mentioned, you know, a few things that that parents might do in terms of like that report card or whatever that that might include some increased perfectionism. Do you notice any other habits that teachers or parents engage in that can also cause increased perfectionism? So my pet peeve <laughs> is this, which is um, when teachers and I am a teacher, so I'm not speaking against teachers. I am a teacher. But when teachers put like they'll only give stickers or smiley faces or whatever their reward system is for perfect work. They only reward hundreds. They don't, our system isn't really set up to reward effort. It isn't set up to reward diligence. It isn't, and, and I don't even know that I would like the word reward here, but maybe recognize. It doesn't acknowledge or recognize mm -hmm. effort and persistence and diligence. It recognizes and responds only to attainment. And I think one of the most damaging things that we have are things like end of year award ceremonies for kids in school. I'll, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that specifically. There is an award. Most people call it the perfect attendance award. Mm -hmm. I call it the unscrupulous parent who sent their kid to school sick while I, at great personal and professional sacrifice, kept my kid home when they were sick award. <laughs> 
And I feel like when you have an award like perfect attendance, I've had kids come to school sick on purpose. Like they know they're sick. Their parents know they're sick, but they've had perfect attendance. And I'm using air quotes. They've had perfect attendance since second grade and they don't want to blow it now in 11th grade because there's some big award. Well, that's such an unreasonable standard. And that kind of perfectionism is harmful not only to yourself or others. And so I think that's one of the things that is set up in the environment. And I think we, there are more things like that than that example, but that one is so blatant and it actually uses the word that I think most people can relate to it. Right. And what I hear you saying here is we're focusing on the product or the outcome as opposed to the process. Yes. And isn't it the process that we need to focus on that's going to help kids learn and grow and, you know, kind of have that growth mindset that we're frequently talking about? Absolutely. Because a child is rarely going to do the exact same task, is rarely going to perform the exact same task in second grade that they do in sixth grade or 10th grade or when they become an adult. What we're really trying to teach them is not necessarily how to complete a math fact sheet, but rather how to use the information that they're learning. And if we really let ourselves think about that, we'll realize that all we're really teaching is process. Mm -hmm. All we're teaching is thinking process and production process, right? Like, and by production, I mean creating a product. So we might be teaching how to write an essay or how to create a PowerPoint or how to conduct a chemical experiment. But we're rarely actually teaching the particular thing that's being graded. Mm -hmm. We're we're rarely doing that. And so we create a false economy of perfectionism when we ask kids to have this aspirational idea of a 100 on the assignment, when really it wasn't even about the assignment. It was about getting there. We'll be back in just a minute. On a recent episode of Mind Matters. This social relational bullying piece. I mean, it's something as simple as being ignored and how damaging that is. Other groups of children gathering together and talking and laughing and that gifted child is being left out. Sometimes the gifted child doesn't have a set of peers that they can be sitting with and feeling accepted. So there is a deep hunger. I mean, it's, it's one of the, the basic human needs to belong, to be accepted, to be valued. That's episode three, available at mindmatterspodcast.com or wherever you get your podcast. We're here with Lisa Van Gammert, author of Perfectionism, A Practical Guide to Managing Never Good Enough. So we were talking about how perfectionism is sometimes fostered by the focus on the outcome of a task instead of the process of the task itself. You know, I I think teachers and parents often forget to ask themselves, what's the real point of completing this assignment? You know, we ask kids to do chores, um, and of course it's to help around the house, but it's also about learning to initiate tasks and be responsible. Um, And sometimes I notice that parents undermine a child's autonomy by coming behind them and, for example, remaking the bed. Mm -hmm. Is it really about how well the bed is made or is it about the child learning how to take care of things? I think that's a really good example of how someone could unwittingly inculcate a dynamic of perfectionism when they didn't feel like it existed because sometimes it seems obvious, right? You're asking your kid to help you cook and they break an egg into the bowl and there's a piece of shell that goes in and the child doesn't have the dexterity to pick it out themselves, so you do. And that seems like an obvious one. And that's at one end of the spectrum. But then we have other people at the other end of the spectrum who, if the bed isn't made exactly right with hospital corners and you you could take a picture of it and put it on Pinterest, they're going to fix that. And so a lot of dealing with perfectionism in ourselves and our children is being completely honest with ourselves about what standards we have. Are these standards reasonable? And if I impose my standards on others, is it out of love or is it out of fear or what is motivating that? Right. Is it my own stuff or is it? Right. <laughs> yeah. Where's that coming from? Exactly. And um, one of the strategies that I teach kids and parents and teachers to use in dealing with this is to consider rating things on a scale of one to five at the level of quality that they deserve. So we have this saying in our society, anything worth doing is worth doing well. That is such a lie. (laughs) Not everything worth doing is worth doing well. 
Right. Lots of things are worth just a lick and a promise. That's what my grandma used to call it, right? Just a lick and a promise. And a lot of things are worth that. I One of the examples I use is, okay, so we can all agree, I think, that taking out the trash out of the house is worth doing, right? Nobody wants to live, I mean, unless you're on the TV show, nobody wants to live in a house, and probably even them, a house full of trash. So we all agree that taking out the trash is worth doing, or is worth doing. But what would it mean to take out the trash well? Like, tie the bow of the bag and like a perfect bow and line up the can exactly perpendicular to the curb and like maybe wash out the can and rub it down with essential oil. I mean, <laughs> you can go so far, right? And so we, I think we have to abandon that idea that just because something needs to be done, there is some set level of attainment that everybody else agrees on and you're the one who has to try to make sure you do it that way. There's no... There's, there is no standard, right? Beyond cleanliness, basic cleanliness and hygiene, the standards that we set for ourselves are the standards that we set for ourselves, that we have to decide as a family. And I think one of the things that we have to consider is that the most important things are the relationships. Now, if there's somebody in the family who gets very stressed and anxious by having a lot of mess in the environment, then that becomes important for other people to help with because we don't want to, through our own habits, make other people's lives uncomfortable and unpleasant. At the same time, if we're the person who um, likes everything very, very neat, then we have to recognize that other people deserve to live to the greatest extent possible in the way that works best for them. So we need spaces, even for our children, where they can be what's comfortable for them. And hopefully, you know, we bring them to our dark side as we go on. But, but <laughs> even small children deserve to be able to manifest their own choices as long as it's not harmful or detrimental to the rest of the family. And so then using, like you mentioned, kind of that rating scale, kind of identifying how... Thank you for bringing me back there, Emily, because I abandoned it. So <laughs> so there's a scale of one to five. So um, a one is it needs to be done, but it doesn't matter how it's done. It just, just get it done, right? A five is something really important is at stake and you need to do your absolute best on this. So perfectionists see everything as a five mm -hmm. when really most things are about a three. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I tell teachers is nothing that you do at school is a five. There are no fives at school. Fives are only things that have long lasting value. And there's no discrete task at school that is a five. Like globally there is, right? Like graduating from high school is probably a five. But within school, we're looking at somewhere in a range of two to four. Teachers should not be assigning ones. Sometimes teachers are forced to do ones in class because of paperwork requirements from districts and government entities. You know, we have to fill out this form. It's a one. But for the most part, we're looking at two to four. And the teachers who I work with on this, I ask them to identify that for students. Like tell the student, this task is a three. This task is a four. This task is a two. And then that helps kids learn to self-evaluate and develop the skill themselves to look at something. And in the book, I actually have a little grid that you can fill out, but anybody can do it just with a piece of scratch paper is sit down and make a list of common tasks that you do. And these could be things like as simple as getting ready in the morning, um, making dinner, washing dishes, different aspects of your job or school. And then what level have you been acting like that thing is? So you've been treating it like it's this or that. And then what level would most people agree that it is? And when you look at it objectively, should you adjust? Like, would, you, would it behoove you to adjust the level at which you're approaching it? So if you have something that you're treating like a five, most people would think it's a two, like making the bed, then can you meet somewhere in the middle? Now, you're not going to take someone who sees something as a five and have them make it a one overnight. You're going to have to dial it back gently because otherwise you will create some anxiety that's not necessary. You know, self-evaluation, you mentioned, I feel like is such an important part of the skill of self-regulation. I feel like that's kind of a big thing that we're always talking about is like, how can we help kids learn to self-regulate? Um, and this is such an important thing, like to help them 
put it into context and put it into perspective and then, like you said, kind of dial it back slowly. I think sometimes we expect problems that took a really long time to manifest to then just change overnight and get fixed. And that's not always the way that it works. Sometimes we have to just give that a little bit more more time. So there's two things there that you said. I totally agree with what you just said. I think that sometimes we abandon strategies that work far too early because we expected them to work overnight, you know, instant panacea. And the second thing is, is that this works in the reverse as well. If people have kids who treat things like they're ones or twos that are actually fours, you can use the same scale method and self-regulation to help them approach the thing in a level that's more appropriate for the task. What would you say, you know, when you're talking to parents or teachers or, or students, what advice or what tips do you give them to help them, if not embrace, at least accept failure or less than perfect? Well, you know, nobody likes to fail. It doesn't feel very good. Um, you don't get big shots of dopamine every time you fail. I think that one of the problems is our connotation, the word failure, right? Now, failures become more po popular. We have lots of people talking about failing forward and all this. But what we're really looking at is how do we accept micro levels of failure? So I'll, I'll start with a really simple one, which is um, the possibilities model. So in this, you would say, okay, what's the best possible thing that could happen here? And then what's the worst possible thing that could happen? And then what is most likely? First of all, if you if the worst possible case happens, you've already kind of had that emotional discussion with yourself. So it's not as devastating. Number two is that you start to see a pattern of, you know, I constantly think that something's going to be or I frequently think that something is going to be the worst case scenario as as the most likely scenario. And that's just not accurate. I'm I I am over catastrophizing things. So if we continually over catastrophize and think that the worst case scenario is going to be the most likely scenario, over time, we become better at calibrating that. So that's one thing that we can do very easily all the time. It doesn't take any time. Is just sit before we're going to do something. What's best, you know, best possible outcome, worst possible outcome. One of the things when I was, I was learning how to quilt and the person who was teaching me how to quilt told me that Amish quilters put a mistake on purpose in their quilts so that um, it, like to demonstrate that they're not God, right? That they know that they're not perfect because they're human. Now I've met some Amish quilters and, and they tell me that that's just a total lie, that they don't need to put a mistake <laughs> in on purpose. But I have met, met quilters whose grandmothers and great grandmothers did this. They called it a God square and they would turn a square in the quilt wrong on purpose. And so one of the things that can be helpful is to, when you make a mistake, is to recognize it and just name it. Just call it like, this is my Amish mistake, right? This is just my Amish mistake. And I just proved that I'm human, right? And, and just looking at it that way, sometimes even just putting that label on it. I had a poster in my classroom that had a quote from Yoda, the great philosopher, <laughs> and it had this exploding planet. And it, and it said, lost a planet, Obi-Wan has. How embarrassing. And when students would come up to me upset about not attaining some, you know, benchmark they'd set for themselves, I would always say the same thing, which is, have you lost a planet? And they would sigh and roll their eyes. No, Mrs. Van. And I'd say, well, then you are not yet at Jedi level failure, young Padawan. Right. And so <laughs> you had to put failure in context. And I think that um, children often struggle with putting failure in context. They get so frustrated with themselves very easily. And, and by children, I mean, you know, people probably through their mid twenties that they just get so frustrated and abandoned. And, and we have to make sure that we are invoking that self-love, that we recognize that not being successful at something that we're trying or not being as successful as we hoped to is actually leading to personal growth and is part of the human experience. I have a friend who's big into CrossFit. And last night, actually, she said to me, just coincidentally, last night she said to me, it's been so good for me to go do something five days a week, week after week after week, and I'm bad at it every day. Mm. Yeah, just to have that experience. So one of the things that we have to do to adjust to that is to constantly be pushing ourselves because if we become complacent in only trying things that we know we're going to be successful at, then we get out of practice in adjusting to failure. And we do have to have practice in adapting to failure. 
And I think that's the other part with high ability and gifted kids is they are so used to doing things well. It just comes very easily. So then it makes it difficult to understand or, or process that when it doesn't go so easily. It's like hitting a wall. It becomes an entire identity crisis, right? We call it imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. They feel like, oh, well, I must not be gifted. I think if you asked probably kids maybe 12 and over who've been identified as gifted, if you ask them to take the test again, Uh, probably 90% of them would feel highly anxious about that and feel like they wouldn't qualify again. That's interesting. Yeah, because they get this idea that, oh, well, if stuff is hard for me, then I can't actually be gifted. Like if I were really gifted, everything would be easy. I would get all A's. I would never have to study because we hear that. And that's another thing you hear adults say, oh, he never had to study in high school or she never really learned how to study. Well, that's not true. Everybody had to study unless they were cheating. Like you can't, you can't get out of AP biology without studying, no matter how smart you are. And so, but we say these pithy sayings and don't realize the, the climate of expectation that that creates in people. So we have to make sure that when we're working with high ability kids as mental health professionals, as teachers, as parents or friends, that we are making sure that we're sharing that feeling of, oh, that's so good that you tried that and that it didn't work, right? Like just because you have a lot of ability doesn't mean it's going to be easy. In fact, the higher ability that you have, probably the more often that you will fail because you'll be trying harder things. I think as people are able to kind of reflect on that and help their their students or their children kind of recognize that that is part of that growth process. It's going to help them kind of overcome that perfectionism. Um, you know, as we wrap up our conversation today, Lisa, I really appreciate your time. Tell us, what are you, what are you currently working on? What's, what's kind of in the works and on the horizon for you? So my best friend um, is a therapist who specializes in working with Gifted. And she and I have begun a book that we are working on together um, called The Gifted Adventure. And it is basically a guide to being gifted for children and adults and helping them overcome. It's not really perfectionism focused, but a lot of aspects of it because um, gifted individuals tend to be even therapeutically different. Um, And so we're looking at that. And um, then I have a business partner, Ian Bird, and he and I have, um, it's called Gifted Guild, and it's an organization for teachers of the gifted, and we do online training for teachers of the gifted. So those are my two big projects right now, in addition to just my normal training that I do of teachers. Awesome. Very good. And how do you want people to find you? People can find me on my website, which is giftedguru.com. And um, there are links there to lots of resources for parents and teachers and gifted individuals. And if someone has a particular question, they're welcome to email me at lisa at giftedguru.com. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope that people will find some of these ideas helpful. A quick break and we'll be right back. To reach the Mind Matters Podcast, go to our website, mindmatterspodcast.com, and click on Contact. Follow us on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod, on Facebook at Mind Matters Podcast, or you can reach our YouTube channel through our website. Lisa's given us a lot of great ideas about shifting the perfectionist mindset into one of self-acceptance and confidence. Who in your life do you think would benefit from some of these strategies? A child? A spouse? Maybe yourself? Perfectionism is the refusal to show any vulnerability. If we constantly avoid being perceived as imperfect and don't allow ourselves to admit we have flaws, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. It's vulnerability that allows us to be authentic, who we really are, and establish those strong relationships with those around us. Giving ourselves permission to make mistakes allows us to be perfectly imperfect. And now, our panel of imperfect experts. To be perfect and um, be right all the time. Especially because I am a gifted kid, I've had this kind of pressure to be very kind of perfect, and I think that's influenced how I handle school and handle just projects by myself. Sometimes, like, just with organization, like, if I have something laid out on the table, they have to be, like, 
neat and organized. People think about perfectionism and they'll think about artists or people who do really well in school. If someone messes it up after I've done it, then that makes me mad. I just say it's not the end of the world. I can try again. I think I get a lot more anxious about just starting projects rather than doing them and kind of finishing them because I'm going to look at a project or an assignment and I'm going to be like, this is going to be a lot of work and everything has to be perfect. I can't do this now. When people think of perfectionists, they think of overachievers. They think of success and you forget about the parts where it just makes you struggle with it. Do you learn something by being perfect every time? You learn by what people would call failing because you had the incorrect hypothesis, but did you really fail or did you learn something new? You have to figure out a balance with perfectionism. It's like I wouldn't want to change the fact that I can focus on the little details. You know, if it's not actually making you happy, then it's not worth it. You have to find the balance. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. See you next time. You gotta help me disappear From all those voices that I fear And all the moments I can handle cause I'm different You have to promise to stay near Oh, you're always telling me the truth That's why I lean on you You got the mind to see what's coming And you're my ears when I can't hear You know what's right from wrong What to say and what to wear You know there's more than I can bear You're always telling me the truth That's why I lean on you Just like you know that I always do Thanks for listening to the Mind Matters Podcast with Emily Kircher Morris. To learn more about us and our mission, go to mindmatterspodcast.com. If you'd like to show your support for Mind Matters, find us in Apple iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe and leave us a positive review. Start a discussion and follow us on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod or on Facebook at Mind Matters Podcast. Help us spread the word about the Mind Matters Podcast. Whenever I've been off all that I can chew, that's when I lean on you. Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services. 